Coming up on Arirang News, the Bank of Korea says the country's economy grew 2.0% last year, the slowest since the global financial crisis. But data from the BOK point to growth picking up in 2020. A case of the deadly coronavirus from China is confirmed in the United States, the first time it's spread outside of Asia. The World Health Organization is set to hold an emergency meeting because millions of Chinese will be traveling overseas for the upcoming holidays. And a North Korean official indicates that the regime is giving up on the nuclear talks with the U.S. and will be pursuing a new path, blaming what he calls America's hostile policies. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in to Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. The deputy director of China's National Health Commission, Li Bin, announced this morning that there are now 440 confirmed cases of the new coronavirus, and a total of nine people have died. The virus, meanwhile, is now spread to South Korea as well as the U.S. Our Yi Gyeong-un has the latest. The new coronavirus strain that originated in the Chinese city of Wuhan has crossed the Pacific, with U.S. health authorities confirming the first case of the virus in the country on Tuesday. A man in Washington state first experienced symptoms after returning a trip to a region near Wuhan. He was hospitalized last week with pneumonia, but was later confirmed to have the Wuhan coronavirus. The virus has already spread beyond China's borders to South Korea, Thailand, Taiwan and Japan, but it is the first time it has appeared outside Asia. Suspected cases are also popping up in other parts of the world, including the Philippines, Hong Kong and Australia. And the situation is fast spreading across China, with more than 300 people infected and six dead as of Wednesday. Among them are people who have not been to Wuhan, meaning that they have contracted the virus indirectly from others. With the situation developing into an international emergency, experts are trying to find the source of the virus, and many are pointing to the illegal exotic animals sold at the fish market in Wuhan, where the virus was first detected. Jeremy Farrar, a specialist in infectious disease epidemics, said the virus may have been lurking in animals for decades before adapting to infect humans. The so-called wet markets in Wuhan illegally sells wild animals, including rodents, bats and raccoons, for local delicacies. And he says those who touch infected animals are exposed to such viruses. The SARS virus outbreak in 2002 came from a raccoon-like animal from China's Guangdong province, and that outbreak led to a ban on the sale of exotic animals. Many experts also say that the upcoming Lunar New Year holiday is a critical milestone in the outbreak's development as millions of Chinese are set to travel overseas during that time. Faced with such urgency, the World Health Organization is set to hold an emergency meeting on Wednesday to discuss whether to classify the situation as an international emergency. Yi gyeong Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in, meanwhile, has ordered South Korean government officials to help contain the, vi the Wuhan coronavirus. The deputy presidential spokesperson said today that the president was briefed on the situation and told officials to look into how the outbreak, outbreak might affect the local economy. After the first case of the virus was confirmed here earlier this week, the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention raised its alert level for the virus from blue to yellow. In other news, North Korea appears to be following through on its threat to take what it's been calling a new path away from the denuclearization talks. A North Korean official at the UN says Washington is still behaving in a hostile way towards the regime, and so Pyongyang no longer feels bound by the commitments it's made. Kan hyung reports. We have already warned that if the United States misjudges our patience, tries to enforce unilateral demand, upon us and persists in imposing sanctions and pressure against my country, we may be compelled to seek a new path for defending our sovereignty and supreme national interest. During a UN disarmament conference in Geneva on Tuesday, North Korea's representative Chu yong said Pyongyang's efforts to mend ties with Washington have been met with hostility. He added that the U.S. claims it wants to resume dialogue but it has no intention to drop its hostile policies toward the regime. As it became clear now that the U.S. remains unchanged in its, in its ambition to block the development of the DPRK and stifle its political system, we found no reason to be unilaterally bound any longer by the commitment that the other party fails to honor. 
The North Korean official did not elaborate on which specific commitments he was referring to, but the U.S. disarmament ambassador called the comments quite concerning. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, the DPRK representative meant by no longer being feeling that it's bound by its commitment. It didn't uh, elaborate on it, but uh, I, I, my hope is that they're not talking about uh, moving away from that agreement that was reached between President Trump and Chairman Kim in 2018. The U.S. officials said Washington is trying to get Pyongyang back to the negotiating table as it's, quote, in the best interest of North Korea, the region, and the global community. Since the Hanoi summit between Kim Jong-un and President Trump ended abruptly without any meaningful results in February 2019, denuclearization talks between the two sides have been left in limbo. Kan Yong-woo, Arirang News. The U.S. flew a plane over Korea's East Sea Tuesday morning to collect air samples and check them for radiation, apparently to monitor the North more closely for any nuclear activity. This is according to the aviation tracking Twitter account Aircraft Spots. It said the plane was a type of special purpose aircraft known as the Constant Phoenix, which had arrived last week at Kadena Air Base in Okinawa, Japan. A South Korean military source said the Constant Phoenix is one of only two types of planes, along with the Cobra Ball surveillance aircraft, whose flights and operation plans the U.S. does not disclose to South Korea, even if they're flown over Korean airspace. The Moon administration is hoping to get cooperation between the two Koreas moving again this year. South Korea's ambassador to the U.S. says that the inter-Korean of the inter-Korean cooperation projects, the most urgent one is connecting the two sides' railways. Kim Min-ji reports. South Korea's ambassador to the U.S., Lee Suyak, has called for the swift resumption of an inter-Korean railway project. Speaking to reporters in Washington on Tuesday, he said he believes a railway project is the one that should be pushed for most urgently, as will take a long time to complete. Despite a joint survey on the North's railways and roads in 2018, no progress has been made since amid the deadlock and denuclearization talks and sanctions on the regime. He added that the underlying principle is that Seoul is seeking to do what it can under the framework of international sanctions on Pyongyang. His comments come after President Moon Jae-in expressed during a New Year's press conference his desire to get inter-Korean cooperation moving again amid the nuclear standoff between North Korea and the U.S. He said Washington has never denied that inter-Korean cooperation is helpful for denuclearization and necessary for improved North Korea-U.S. relations, adding that stance hasn't changed. We have to get inter-Korean relations back into a virtuous cycle, and any agreements reached between the two Koreas will help the resumption of North Korea-U.S. dialogue. As for discussions and their working group, a task force set up by the Allies in 2018 to coordinate over North Korea-related issues, he said that, as far as he knows, Washington has never rejected any proposals put forward by Seoul. Concerns have been raised over a possible rift between the Allies over the matter, but he said they have been effectively exchanging views through the group, and until now the U.S. has always concluded that South Korea's plans do not violate sanctions. Kim min Arirang News. The South Korean economy last year grew at the slowest pace in a decade. But with growth in the fourth quarter faster than expected, an economic recovery could be underway. Kim hye sung reports. South Korea's economy grew by 2% in 2019. That's on par with the Bank of Korea's forecast made in November, but the slowest pace since 2009 when the world was in the midst of the global financial crisis. The central bank attributed the lower reading to slower global growth, the U.S.-China trade dispute and falling chip prices, but added that the local economy's fourth quarter growth was the fastest in more than two years, recording 1.2 percent, mainly supported by government spending. Private spending grew at a similar pace in the third quarter, but government spending increased sharply. The contribution of government spending to GDP growth increased from 0.2 percent to 1 percent in the fourth quarter as government spending in SOC projects and welfare shot up. Private spending grew 0.7 percent on quarter in the October to December period. Facilities investment went up and construction investment jumped more than 6 percent. Exports, however, declined 0.1 percent in volume terms in the fourth quarter. 
for 2019 as a whole, government spending increased by a 10-year high of 6.5 percent and private spending increased by about 2 percent. Exports went up 1.5 percent. Both facilities and construction investment fell. As for 2020, the central bank forecasts South Korea's economy to grow 2.3 percent on a slight easing of trade tensions between the U.S. and China and an increase in chip prices. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. Out of all of South Korea's big conglomerates, only Samsung Electronics and POSCO have managed to make over 1 trillion won of operating profits each year for the past two decades. This is according to the Sustainable Growth Institute on Wednesday. A trillion won is about 860 million U.S. dollars. Back in 2010, 22 companies had annual operating profits at or above that amount. However, the number has fallen since then. Just 13 firms hit the trillion one mark in 2013 and 18 firms in 2017 and 2018. The Institute said big businesses need to take a fresh approach and look for new opportunities. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin says a phase two trade deal with China will not necessarily be a, quote, big bang. At, World Economic, at the World Economic Forum in Davos on Tuesday, he said the deal could remove some tariffs, but not all. As for a digital tax on American companies in Europe, Mnuchin warned that Italy and Britain will face U.S. tariffs if they go ahead with one. Also at the forum, Chinese Vice Premier Han Zheng said the underlying trend of China's economy is unchanged. Beijing, he added, is opening its doors wider to the world, and he criticized trade protectionism. Time now for an in-depth look at the market news this afternoon. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Dr. Song Su Yang, Professor of Business at Jungang University. Professor Song, thank you for coming on today. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah. So uh, the pneumonia virus from China, it's spreading to other countries in Asia and has even arrived in the United States. There are fears it could really go global. So what effect is this having uh, economically or market-wise? Uh, Market-wise, currently the Hang Seng Index, particularly in Hong Kong, stock has been affected so much. But in U.S. and other countries have not uh, just modestly affected uh, so far because uh, this is uh, in comparison with the previous case of SARS, which has broken out, uh, which have broken out in the 2003 and two, uh, two and three. So at that time, the Chinese government response was uh, under the secrecy. But right now, uh, currently, the Chinese government has opened and then tried to contain the, uh, this kind of coronavirus. And on the other hand, uh, the symptom that is associated with this novel and the new coronavirus, Wuhan, uh, this is Wuhan pneumonia, what? Uh, this, uh, the symptom was not as severe as uh, that was in SARS. So to that regard, I believe that the impact is relatively limited worldwide. All right. Well, the uh, financial markets and uh, FX, FX markets, though, do seem a little unnerved by the pneumonia situation. So when there are diseases breaking out like this, what kind of effect does it usually have on the markets? And what do the Korean authorities need to do about this? Uh, I believe the Korean, currently the, uh, the confirmed case is just one. But however, particularly the Chinese economy, as long as uh, particularly tourism and the travel industry could be affected. But in worldwide, the, the luxury goods uh, producers such as uh, Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, those kind of luxury goods could be affected because Chinese people may refrain from spending money because of these uh, uh, spread of the disease. But in Korea, I think the effect is relatively very uh, limited. But however, as long as the travel industry is affected, then it could have uh, some percussion in the some uh, industry in travel industry and tourism industry in Korea also. But I don't think this could be a, a catastrophe at all, just a modestly or limited impact. So not affected as much as the, less than the effect that was in case of SARS, definitely. 
Got it. Well, in other news, we have the World Economic Forum now underway in Davos. President Trump uh, is there, so that puts an extra emphasis on diplomacy. What kind of things should we be watching for at Davos? Uh, actually, Donald Trump, uh, right now, the, the, the impeachment process in earnest has started, so that could be a really a uh, burden, even though he just uh, maintained the attitude uh, that he do, did not care much about and he's not afraid or worry about anything about in U.S. But clearly it could have uh, some impact because in Davos Forum, the European countries, particularly the France and the German, are concerned about the tariff issues, digital taxation tariff that was imposed by France in retaliation, what kind of tariff could be possible and then uh, Trump Donald Trump's speech does not uh, show any indication of the imminent tariff imposition on the motor uh, car makers in Germany and uh, some other retaliative uh, tax uh, tariff on the European countries but clearly uh, Donald Trump has always emphasized his uh, success of the negotiation of the trade deal because of the imposition of tariff on the other countries such as China and Mexico and other countries. Therefore, the European countries are I believe they are the next. But in the speech, he did not show any indication. But clearly. Uh, and also, the, re the other reason is the people at Davos and the people around the world has been accustomed to the, the way the behavior and the habitual uh, aspect of the Donald Trump, because he always uh, used the very exaggerated expressions such as the biggest, the most, or the never seen before. This kind of expression has... Uh, uh, created uh, some mood of the anxiety in the past. However, now people begin to wait and see because they have uh, observed that Trump's uh, action is quite different from what his speech was. Therefore, I think the currently, at least the, the general, uh, the minister of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Treasury Department Munusin has uh, mentioned some kind of uh, potential tariff and uh, the phase two U.S.-China trade resolution will not be as expected as, uh, but uh, still the mood is not, uh, not as severe as expected. So cautiously, I believe that uh, the economy goes but the problem is all over the all around the world. Uh, in 2019, was the lowest uh, growth rate around the world, and then still uh, the private investors and uh, private economies are concerned about the stagnant stagnant growth rate will be maintained will continue. As a result, uh, we uh, we expect more. Uh, dependence upon the government spending, we have no, I don't think we have other choices other than government spending. So that's why the government exists. Mm. Got it. Interesting point there, Professor Song. No, nothing too dramatic coming out of Davos yet, but uh, we'll have to leave it there for today. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing mm -hmm. your insights. Yeah, thank you. At Davos on Tuesday, though, it was a showdown on climate change. On that issue, two very different messages from U.S. President Donald Trump and Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg. Our Park Hee Jun has more. Two of the most high-profile attendees at the World Economic Forum in Davos ensured it was impossible to miss the annual meeting. U.S. President Donald Trump and teenage climate activist Greta Thunberg carried on their indirect debate on climate change. In his keynote speech on Tuesday local time, President Trump revealed that the U.S. will join the initiative to plant one trillion trees. Today I am pleased to announce the United States will join one trillion trees initiative being launched here at the World Economic Forum. One trillion trees. 
While this year's forum is focused on how businesses must change to save the planet, President Trump's more than 30-minute-long speech was devoted to highlighting the importance of the oil and gas industries, with promises on climate change nowhere to be found. Instead, he warned against listening to the, quote, prophets of doom. This is not a time for pessimism. This is a time for optimism. Fear and doubt is not a good thought process because this is a time for tremendous hope and joy and optimism and action. But to embrace the possibilities of tomorrow, we must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. Sitting in the audience for the speech was Thunberg. Speaking shortly after President Trump's special address, the Swedish activists took aim at Trump and other world leaders, accusing them of doing nothing and making empty promises on climate change. You say children shouldn't worry. You say, just leave this to us. We will fix this. We promise we won't let you down. Don't be so pessimistic. And then, nothing. Silence. Or something worse than silence. Empty words and promises which give the impression that sufficient action is being taken. She also criticized the lack of action to reduce carbon emissions when the world is, in her words, on fire. I wonder, what will you tell your children was the reason to fail and leave them facing a climate chaos that you knowingly brought upon them? That it seemed so bad for the economy that we decided to resign the idea of securing future living conditions without even trying? Our house is still on fire. Your inaction is fueling the flames by the hour. Their mutual dislike of each other has been in the spotlight since last year. Their last encounter was at the UN last September. Photos and videos of Thunberg glaring at President Trump as he passed by after the climate change summit went viral at the time. It was followed by a tweet by the American leader saying Thunberg should work on her anger management issues. Park Hee-jun, Airang News. Now, one problem for today's computer programmers is that human feelings are often hard to describe or quantify. But with artif artificial intelligence, scientists are making progress on software that can actually improve our mental well-being. Also, Young has more. Human emotions can be difficult to read, but this artificial intelligence program analyzes facial expressions to provide a snapshot of a person's mental well-being. Multisense detects various facial and vocal attributes, including eye gaze, eyebrow movement and intonation, using computer vision, language processing and other algorithms. Through a 5-10 to 10 minute interview with a doctor or a virtual human, the programme can provide insights to help doctors diagnose their patients. We reached this initial stage, which was we wanted to know, is, is, this, uh, is it possible, do we see behavior markers, can computer quantify? And the good news is we've seen many of them. We have now uh, the exact count, I forgot exactly, but about 25 of these behavior markers for depression, for anxi anxiety, for PTSD, and even for suicidal ideation and uh, for uh, psychosis. Using AI to detect and analyze human emotions is a niche field called effective computing that's expected to grow into a $40 billion market by 2022, growing at an average pace of 43% a year. The possibilities range from mood tracking apps and mental wellness chatbots to learning tools for children with autism to help them develop emotional intelligence. Brainy Technologies, for instance, helps children with autism or ADHD to improve their concentration through computer games. Eye gaze detectors determine the level of focus. So being able to uh, pay attention to things in their periphery and shift attention appropriately, um, that's uh, about a 35% improvement. And in inhibitory control, there was actually a 65% improvement. And that's the skill that's going to allow them to stay focused on whatever they're working on without getting easily distracted by other things going on around them. Adding AI to the equation would help customize attention-enhancing activities for each individual, allowing meaningful progress. Wearable devices powered by AI are also providing something of a sixth sense. A smart wristband developed by an MIT spin-off helps users regulate their mood by adjusting their body temperature. 
we create different waveforms. So those are the algorithms dictating reading temperature from your skin and how and the differential from that and how much we should deliver in terms of those on-off sensations to maintain that perception of cooling or warming. As AI continues to evolve, not only in terms of simple intelligence, but also human sensibilities, it could help us become smarter and more mindful of our emotional well-being. Oseong Arirang News, Pittsburgh. And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.